All right, welcome back to another episode of Time Out with the Sports Doctor. Uh, very glad that you're back with us again this week. And thank you for all the support, almost two and a half years now of this podcast. And one of the main goals that I had during the podcast was to increase my public speaking, whether it's motivational speaking or speaking about educational topics. That was one of the things that I wanted to do as a personal goal for myself. And, you know, many times we have intentions, but unless we're making it known what our intentions are, other people don't really know what our skill set may be. So over the last couple of months, I've had several opportunities to speak, not only on the news, but I participated in a virtual NIL combine, as well as I was a virtual speaker for a health summit. I recently had an opportunity to go on a live radio show for Mississippi Public Broadcasting uh, with Dr. Mary McLeod on the Southern Remedy for Kids and Teens show. And this show is where they discuss medical topics about affecting kids and teens throughout the state. You can call in, guests can call in and ask questions. So I was on to talk about sports injuries, um, heat related injuries, and just things as the school go gets back in session and kids are involved in the athletics, just discussing some of the hot topics. So I wanted to share this opportunity with you this actual interview, I always like to share when I'm interviewed by someone else, because I always seem that I learn a lot about myself when I'm interviewed by someone else. So I wanted to share this with you as the audience. So we'll get into this episode shortly, but please go over to the website, www.drderekthesportsdoctor. Make sure that you subscribe to the mailing list, uh, follow us on social media so you can get all the updates. And we'll be sending out a survey shortly because as we enter the fourth quarter of the year, I want to make sure that we're giving you content that's relevant for your life and that's going to be effective to help you maximize the last few months of the year and to get ready to start 2024 off on a, on a high note. So without further ado, we'll get into this interview. Fall sports are here and our kids also are just prone to injuries. And so today in our show, we have Dr. Derek Burgess. He is an orthopedic surgeon at UMC. He's going to be answering all of your orthopedic questions. We're going to talk some about sports injuries. And as always, we would love to hear from you. So tell us a little bit about yourself. I, this is my first time meeting you as well. Yeah. So. so I am new to the university. I've been here for now three months. I practice medicine or practice orthopedics in Laurel, Mississippi for nine years before moving to Jackson. So um, I'm in my 10th year of practice now. I love taking care of the things that people, like you mentioned, it's a specialty that you don't really learn about until after you complete medical school. So mm -hmm. we do a five-year residency where we learn about bones, joints, fractures, injuries of that sort, but it is definitely a subspecialty, um, and we have to treat injuries across the board from trauma to sports injuries, which is what I specialize in, but we treat a lot of fractures, bumps and sprains, but also ligament tears. We do joint replacements and things of that nature as well. So I guess let's just start with some basic things because, you know, fall sports are here yes. and we think about uh, the ones that mostly come to my mind are football and right. soccer. I yeah. feel like those are the biggest ones in the fall. And so with that, we see a lot of injuries. Mm -hmm. Gosh, my little cousin started football last night. He's only in fifth grade or it was Monday. And he's so tiny anyway, and he got smoked. I mean, it, the video <laughs> is terrible. And I'm just so worried about him because we see so many injuries. Yes. So what are the most common injuries, I guess, we could say that you can see between football and soccer what, what, this time of year? Yeah, so common things are going to be minor, generally. We're going to see a lot of ankle sprains, a lot of just bumps and bruises, contusions. Mm -hmm. uh, but more serious things are fractures, of course. As you mentioned, your little cousin got smoked. Mm. We're always worried about a head or neck injury. Yes. You know, does he have a concussion? We need to watch him really closely after they take a major impact to the head to make sure that they're conscious, number one, that they are not having any altered mental status, if they're not dizzy, headaches, blurred vision, things of that nature. Those are things that we're really concerned about, and that's what we're really there to try to see who's not safe to return to play. Outside of that, we also see knee injuries, meniscus tears, ligaments tears, especially in those soccer athletes and mm -hmm. the football players. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about what is a sprain? Because I feel like you hear this term all the time, and right. 
it may just be like, you know, the old man getting his little workout and playing basketball with some friends who sprains his ankle versus like the NFL athlete that you hear has a sprain. And, you know, like there's varying degrees of sprains, I guess, is the way I want to say it. So can you tell us a little bit about just kind of basic what is a sprain and what are the different degrees of the sprain? So let's start off first and say strain versus sprain, right? So strain is for muscle. And sprain is for ligament. So a ligament attaches bone to bone, uh, where a a muscle has a tendon that attaches the the muscle to the bone. So many times we'll see a strain of a muscle. You hear people say, hey, I strained my hamstring Mm -hmm. or I sprained my ankle. So what they're meaning, a sprain is where the ligament has been injured but not completely torn. So there is degrees between a minor sprain where it's the ligament's injured, the degree of the severity of it is leading towards a tear. So mm-hmm. once it's torn, it's no longer sprained, it's completely torn. Probably the most common thing we see injured is a sprained ankle. Mm-hmm. So most sprained ankles can be treated at home. But a severe sprain, if you see excessive swelling or excessive bruising, then that's something that we need to first rule out a fracture. Um, and then you might have to have a little more elevated care. You might need to be on crutches for a while. Um, or be put even in a walking boot or a cast at sometimes, very rarely, or use an assist device like a crutch to get around to help take some weight off the injury. Mm -hmm. And then we're focused on getting the swelling down and improving the range of motion immediately. So for sprains, do you usually have to do surgery, even if it is like a significant one? Or a lot of times can you treat it supportively and just it'll slowly heal on its own? Very, very rarely are you treating a ankle sprain surgically right away. Okay, most of them are going to be treated with the RICE method that we know, Mm -hmm. rest, ice, uh, compression, elevation. And then we will progress with therapy, range of motion and strengthening and or plus or minus bracing. And generally, the athlete will be able to get back to their sport with just doing that. Okay, and then prevention. That's what I wanted to say, because, you know, we hear these happen all the time. And especially I feel like basketball is the biggest sport. I mean, I know it can happen with any, but I just remember basketball. Everybody spraying their ankles when you come (laughs) down and all of that. So what are some things that parents and grandparents or even adults that are still very active? What can they do to help prevent this from happening? So one thing is um, wearing good shoe wear, supportive shoe wear, but also it's learning certain techniques about how to land, how to jump land, how to cut, how to change direction properly. Those are some things that we can teach kind of from a preventative measure. I won't say that everyone needs to wear an ankle brace to to prevent an ankle sprain, um, but we do do a lot of strengthening around the ankle, uh, proprioceptive things where we try to teach the kid how to land properly and change direction to try to prevent the injury because a lot of what we do as sports medicine physicians is injury prevention as well. Mm -hmm. And I've always heard if you've sprained one side, you're more likely to sprain the other side or injure the other side just because you kind of favor the other side from the old injury. Many times you're compensating. What we typically see with ankle sprains is you sprain your ankle, you rest for a little bit, and as soon as you feel better, you go back to your sport and without doing the proper rehab to strengthen the ankle. So mm-hmm. we know that weak ankles are more prone to be uh, sprained again. Mm-hmm. So the part that people are typically missing is the doing the physical therapy or the exercises that are needed to strengthen the ankle after that initial injury. Gotcha. And so if do you recommend a brace or to prevent or no, not really? No, we don't. Okay. I mean, if you're paying, playing certain positions, we might do prophylactic bracing, but for the general public, we do not. Doesn't really help yeah. much. I never really, I mean, people always used to wear them when we were in high school yeah. in sports, and I never really understood how they would be that beneficial because mm-hmm. a lot of them, I'm like, they're really not giving you that much support. If they're know. worn properly. Yeah. You know, that's another thing. Well, People too, come yeah. into the office, especially with the knee immobilizers. I call them ankle braces because half of the time the knee is exposed. And it's you not know, even in the right place. And it's riding on the ankle. So I don't, you will always have that person that comes in and they'll have a brace on both ankles and a brace on both knees. But what you're missing is the doing the bracing of yourself by strengthening the muscles around the joint because that's what's protective. Um, so that's a big part of it. Yeah. Well, I want to talk some more about that, in particular, talk some about uh, physical therapy and some other things, uh, strengthening, getting ready for, you know, 
I feel like people downplay physical therapy so Absolutely. much, but physical therapy is so important. Strengthening everything around the yes. joints makes such a big difference. And so I want to get into that some. Um, and then I want to talk about just some basic injuries and what people can do if they're in the football field on Friday night and, and what we can do for that. So Dr. Burgess, we were talking during the break about the after hours clinic that y'all have. Uh, UMC does this on Friday nights and it's a great option. So tell us a little bit about what that is. So during the football season, we run an after-hours clinic. So it starts around 9 o'clock and ends around 11.30. What we do is we take care of local high schools. We have athletic trainers that go out almost daily to each school. So we're affiliated with those schools, so we know what's going on there. So the athletes that are injured during the game, we'll bring them over to the university um, pavilion, uh, physician's pavilion, and we can see the athlete right away. So it allows you to not have to go to the emergency room or wait until Monday to figure out what's going on with your athlete. I feel that this service is necessary because making the early diagnosis allows us to start treatment right away. But it's open also to the public as well. Anyone that's playing high school sports, junior high sports, they can come in right after the game on Friday and be seen. Yeah, and it's at the pavilion, so you all have the ability to do x-rays, yes. and I wouldn't think you would do much advanced imaging. I don't know. No, so x-rays, yeah. we do a screening x-rays. If you need an MRI or something, that will be scheduled later, but we right. start treatment right away. I mean, if you have a broken bone, you're leaving with the splint or brace that you need, and we're also able to come up with a treatment plan on that night and even talk to the athletic trainer at the school and so they can start and be on the same page with us. And you don't have to wait in the ER. That's the main <laughs> thing, right? You leave straight from the field and you're seen right away without that wait. So what are some things that you can do? I want to talk a little bit about what you can do if you're at a football game or you're at a soccer game and somebody gets hurt. Because that happens all the time and I feel like everybody always looks and it's like, where's the doctor? <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, not even that. Maybe, you know, you're just there. It's small. I mean, I went to a really small school. We didn't really have athletic trainers. We just had the local doctor that was there. Yes. And so, you know, it may be that some parents need to help jump in and help. So what are some things you can do if you, you know, see somebody and you suspect they have a broken bone or maybe they have a really bad sprain? I guess we can start with those injuries first and then we can talk a little bit about concussions, too. OK. Yeah. As you mentioned, it's a luxury to have medical providers at your sporting event, especially for younger children. You might have a parent that's in the medical field, um, but generally high school Sports will have an athletic trainer, possibly a physician present. It could also always be someone in the stands. But if you're a coach or a parent and you see an injury, uh, first assess to make sure that is there any deformity. So if you see a deformity of a limb after someone falls or takes a big hit, then there's a good chance that that limb is broken. So in that particular circumstance, you want to get them to a urgent care or a emergency room as soon as possible to get further imaging. Now, if the limb is, if you have an open injury where the skin actually is broken and the bone is sticking out, you might need to have, if it's a major bone, you might need to call the emergency department, you know, so they can send an ambulance out to transport that person. Uh, but mount, mostly if you have a minor ankle sprain or if the kid just has a bump or bruise and you don't see that deformity or the skin is not broken, you're usually able to put some ice on it. And if the swelling, if it's not immense swelling, just stabilize the kid, make sure their pain is controlled. You can watch it for a few days. If they're not progressing, then get them in to see a medical professional. Yeah. I guess the biggest difference between if the bone is exposed or not is such the high risk for infection. Absolutely. And so that's why it's so important to, I mean, a lot of, I don't know. I feel like parents, kids complain about things all the time. And so a lot of times you may not even realize your kid broke a bone. Right. <laughs> um, and you may wait a couple of days to take them to the doctor. And, you know, usually that's fine. They yeah. do fine. You really don't have any major long-term problems with that. But the if parent the, might suffer from a little kind of psychological. A little guilt. Yeah, but, guilt. <laughs> <laughs> but the long term, for the most part, they're going to do fine. Yes. But if the bone is exposed, which I think would freak enough people out right. to go straight to the doctor. Yes. But that is a very high risk for infection and so you want to make sure you get them treated asap so Absolutely. yeah that's i've never re really even thought about that calling the ambulance i yeah. just would have thought just load the kid up and go straight there but sure. that probably is really important you can go on and start making sure it's clean and protected right away well it depends on what bone is broken it's well, different if it's a finger or maybe even a wrist but if you have a long bone like your femur mm -hmm. that person's not going to be very comfortable with 
you transporting them at all. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So you mentioned a sprain and you can kind of treat it at home for a few days and then come into the doctor. One of the things you also had mentioned was uh, you want to make sure there's no fracture there too. So what are some signs that, because I know from just personal experience, I tripped down the stairs and twisted my ankle, but I kept having like this pain in my foot and the swelling was so bad and it wouldn't go away. And turns out I'd actually fractured something in my foot as well and ended up in a boot for a couple of weeks. So what are some signs that you can look for to say that, oh, wait, this may be more than just a sprain. Maybe I should take them into the doctor besides just the pain, because, I mean, a sprain hurts, too. Right, correct. If you sprain it bad enough, I mean, I, s- I told people that I'm no longer going to say, oh, it's just a sprain, because just a sprain hurts pretty bad, too. So yeah. so when should they be worried that there could be something else going on? Yeah. So one thing people will say, well, if you can move it, it's not broken. Or if you can walk on it, it's not broken. And that's not, not true. <laughs> that's not true, 100 percent. Because as you mentioned, you can have a if the bones are still intact or meaning that they have not completely moved out of alignment, you can put weight on it and you might, you're going to have some pain, but you can still walk on a a broken ankle even or Mm. a broken foot. People walk around on broken toes all the time. So pain that does not improve, swelling that does not improve or that it's really severe swelling. It's one thing to have swelling for a slight ankle sprain, but when you have swelling and bruising, Mm-hmm. that shows that there's usually something deeper going on or that the extent of the injury is worse. So excessive swelling, um, excessive bruising, difficulty with putting weight on the extremity is one thing, but just because you can put a little weight on it does not mean that it's not broken. And many times people will come in, especially if you have altered sensation from a maybe diabetes or something else, people will walk on extremities that are severely broken for a while before mm-hmm. they ever come in. So if you know that you're You don't have normal sensation or normal feeling in your hands or your feet or whatever. We have to be a little more cautious in that uh, circumstance. If you're enjoying this episode, don't wait to the end to share it. Share it now. Share this with a friend or a colleague that you think might find value in this information. And then also make sure that you click and leave us a five-star review and give us feedback because we really value your feedback and your input. Now back to the episode. So the next couple of things I wanted to talk about, and I feel like they kind of go hand in hand, is talking about PT and conditioning to hopefully prevent some of these injuries, in particular overuse injuries, because we see that so all the time with kids Correct. and adults. I've had yes. it as well. So you can, you, we see this so much, and I feel like a lot of it could be prevented if you knew the signs to look for, if you knew the proper techniques and some of the stretching and things like that that go along with that. So I guess let's just start real quick and run through like some of the most common overuse injuries that we see in kids and adults as well. So I feel like knees in particular, and then we talked some last week about baseball too, like how it's so important to make sure your kid's not specialized for just one sport for too long Correct. and trying to get them involved in multiple things because of the overuse injuries. So I don't know, maybe you have other ones, but knees and elbows are the ones I think about the most. Yeah, I'd say shoulders. I would throw that yeah, in as shoulder well. Too. Um, but we see it a lot. And let's start off with kids because the thing that makes kids and adults different really is their bone, their bone structure the open growth plates or physis, mm-hmm. which is something that from the recurrent or the repetitive stress put on that part of the bone, they can lead to fractures or just growing pain sometimes. So we have to realize that kids' bodies are different. So in order to have normal, healthy growth, they need nutrients, they need rest, as well as you know the physical strengthening. So Many times that's ignored, and we see now athletes or children playing the same sport a lot Mm -hmm. for three, four seasons of the year. So recommended that they take at least three months off from a sport in a calendar year to allow their body to rest or to do cross training or to play another sport Um, because I feel that becoming a good athlete is more than just learning how to play your sport. Mm -hmm having being a really skilled in your sport it's important to have athleticism and that comes from when we were kids we got out on the playground we ran and jumped we were on the merry-go-round on the monkey bars Mm -hmm. but it's hard to even find a playground with 
that equipment on it now, and kids are inside so much. We talked about bone health while we were on break, but that exposure to the sun is very important as well Mm -hmm. so that your body can absorb uh, vitamin D from the sun and different things of that nature. And the stress that you put on your bones from running and jumping helps your bones to be stronger. And we know that after you hit your 30s, it's starting to decline. So those early years of putting the stress on your bones help the bones develop and Uh, become a stronger bone so that you can prevent injury. Uh, But talking about some of the overuse things that we see, um, you mentioned elbows, especially in baseball. Mm -hmm. When you're throwing the ball and you're using that same motion over and over, part of your shoulder will get lax or loose and part of your shoulder will get tight. And if you don't have the normal mechanics of throwing the ball, it can lead to stress on the elbow. So we, you know, many baseball fans will know about Tommy John surgery. Mm -hmm. Now we're starting to see that in teenagers instead of adults. And that's from exposures as well as mechanics, um, but mainly exposure to the sport so much with using that same repetitive motion over and over. Mm -hmm. Uh, We also see some things in swimmers where they're using the same muscles Mm -hmm. and you'll have one part of the body that's really developed and another part that's underdeveloped. So any sport or anything where you're using that same muscle group and soccer players kicking, kicking, kicking over and over and over. They'll have really strong quadricep muscles, but possibly weak hamstring mm-hmm. muscles. And we know that that's something that can lead to ACL or serious knee injury. So we really recommend cross training for your athletes, taking a true off season to really be able to do rehab for injuries or preventative measures for strengthening and other parts of the body. Yeah. And I think maybe for our adult listeners who aren't playing baseball and uh, sports yeah. uh, with the upper arms is like golf and tennis. We yes. see that a lot in yeah. adults as well. Yeah. Epicondylitis. Mm-hmm. Which I guess is a little different. I don't know if maybe you want to go into that too, but it's essentially the same thing. It's just how can they prevent some of those injuries as adults? So adults, we proper warm up. Many times we're rushed in time. So we want to go and we want to play whatever sport, pickleball, golf, tennis, and we already know we have 45 minutes to get it done and we want to play for that whole time. But really taking five to 10 minutes to warm your body up can prevent strains and sprains. Um, Helping your body get ready for that sport is really important for especially tennis elbow or golf and tennis elbow is doing stretches of your forearm and strengthening of the forearm because that's what's being used Um, repetitively in those sports because if you come in with the problem that's what we're going to do so if you do some of the stretches or strengthening ahead of time that could possibly prevent getting an injury so let's talk about some of the strengthening exercises and stretches and how it's so important and how PT can play such an important role in orthopedics Um, because I feel like that's one of the first things we always try to do as primary care doctors is refer to PT before we send them to y'all. Yes. But a lot of people just want to go straight to the doctor. Sure. And they, you know, it's hard to explain how that can be so important until I guess you've experienced it and seen how significantly people can improve with it. So tell us a little bit about that and how it's, why it's so important. I feel like one of the things that one of the PTs told me once is you always want to make sure that the muscles around the joint are strong. Correct. And that is how you prevent injury. That, yes. And so to me, that's what I usually tell people, because that just makes sense. You know, like if you're, you know, you mentioned the quads being too strong and the hamstrings aren't strong enough, then you potential to injure your knee. And, and so it makes it that to me, when they said that, that made so much sense. And I know that sounds so basic, but tell us a little bit about that and why that's so important. Yeah. First, let's recognize our physical therapists that yes. do a great job. They make surgeons look good. <laughs> <laughs> they keep some people from having to have surgery. However, Most patients feel that when they hear the word PT, oh, I'm on my feet all the time. My job requires me to, I'm lifting, bending, stooping for eight hours a day, so I'm doing my therapy. Mm -hmm. I don't need to go see a physical therapist. Or they say, oh, I can do it on my own. I work out. I know how to work out. I can do it on my own. What they fail to realize is the different forms of therapy that are available when you actually go to a facility, Mm -hmm. from ultrasound to STEM, E-STEM, the cryotherapy, different things to actually warm the joint before going into motion. So they have dry needling, things Mm -hmm. of that nature, that you cannot do at home by any stretch. But most people just think, I'm going to go to therapy. They're going to hurt me. 
and then I have to come home and be in pain. Mm -hmm. I said, even on a bad day, still go to therapy. We can just focus on icing or getting the swelling edema out of the limb. If you tell your therapist, hey, this is bothering me, I always tell them, if there's some an exercise that they do that you don't feel comfortable with, please communicate and say, you know what, when we were doing that, I hurt here. This mm -hmm. didn't feel right. And they can come up with an alternate exercise or skip the exercise altogether. Um, so people are always surprised when I say, look, just go for four to six weeks. Give it a shot. If you don't like it, stop. But I think it will help you. Mm -hmm. And many times they'll come back in and say, you know what, you are right. Going to therapy really did help. I really wasn't expecting that much you know, results from going to therapy. Mm -hmm. And when you're stronger, typically you're going to feel better. You're going to have better mobility, uh, better strength. Yeah. Always tell patients, if you're a physical therapist, if you're not tired, sore, and hurting Correct. a little bit yeah. after your PT, then you probably need a new physical therapist. Yes, yes. I said, <laughs> it's my job to be the good guy. The therapist should be the bad yeah. guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because if they're not hurting you just a little bit, then you're probably not doing enough because that's how you get the results is you got to push yourself a little bit and, you know, strengthen those things that aren't strong too. So yeah, if you've been out of the gym for a while and you go back to work out, you're going to have muscle soreness. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't last for weeks upon, you know, weeks, but you should be sore for 48, 72 hours as your body's clearing some of that lactic acid out. But that's going to be the same thing with therapy. They're going to push you enough within a safe limit and you're going to still have soreness. Your body should improve in a couple of days. So communicate with your therapist. Communicate with your doctor. Yeah. I feel like the most unfortunate thing about PT is a lot of time insurance coverage because yes. a lot of times it's not fully covered, um, mostly for our Medicare patients. I feel like we can always get it covered. And a lot of times our kids with Medicaid can, yes. but the private insurance is in between sometimes that can be a little tricky. Mm -hmm. So if you can figure out a way to just get to a couple of sessions is what I tell people and just learn the Correct. things. And then also if you tell your therapist up front, you know, that, hey, I'm not going to be able to afford all these sessions. Right. So a lot of times they can be a little bit more aggressive in the beginning. Like I had to go to PT one time and she was like, all right, well, we're going to, I want to try dry needling in you. I want to do this right away. And I think I can get you feeling better pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as long as you be up front with them and tell them, hey, look, I'm not going to be able to do it probably the full two months. But if you can just give me a few sessions and learn everything and maybe be a little bit more aggressive with some of those alternative therapies that you were mentioning, you can get a lot of benefit out of it because I know just from personal experience with private insurance they don't cover it very well right. not for long <laughs> and mm -hmm. that's a problem for our post-op patients right. where an ACL you're talking 9 to 12 months sometimes before you're back to your sport mm -hmm. and you might have 20 visits or even sometimes even 10 to 12 visits mm -hmm. and we have to try to figure out how can we manage this patient that gap that we're talking about leaves the patient at risk for injury. It leaves the parents and coaches not really knowing what to do with the patient. And that's kind of that gap that we can fill with a sports performance program where you can have an exercise physiologist or a strength and conditioning coach that's comfortable with dealing with these post-op patients where they can follow a continuation of their physical therapy protocol mm -hmm. in order to still monitor the kid and or the athlete to make sure that they're doing what they need to do to continue to progress because it is a problem yeah. and it seems to only be getting worse yeah. Uh, yeah. with approval. Yeah. I feel like most of the time it's you got to meet your deductible first and then they'll pay. But, yeah. you know, you got to pay into that deductible first. So. And it's still going to be limited. Yeah. So one of the things that we had talked about during the break and – I can say from a primary care standpoint, you know, preventative, we talked about how the importance of conditioning and stretching and all the things that go with that to prevent injuries, especially, you know, ligament injuries, but also, I guess, fractures as well. But from a primary care standpoint, one of the things for preventing fractures is your bone health. And so weight training is very important in that, especially yes. as I tell women all the time in particular, because women, as you get older and once you hit menopause and you lose that estrogen which is one of the biggest players in bone strength you know women are such high risk for osteoporosis Correct. osteoporosis is basically just thinning of your bones which makes you more prone to fractures and broken bones so women in particular are higher risk of that and so trying to stress that to my postmenopausal women and even myself who's is not menopausal yet and but 
hate weight training. <laughs> it's my least favorite thing. My husband gets on to me all the time. He's like, you run all the time. You exercise all the time. Why won't you lift some weights? But And he calls me out when I pick up both of the kids and I'm holding both of the kids. And he's like, <laughs> you can pick up both of them, but you can't pick up a 10 pound weight. Yeah. And I'm like, I just hate it. Sure, I hate it. Sure. But it is so important in our bone strength. You've got to put a little bit of resistance on those bones. So I try to stress that to everybody, but especially postmenopausal women who don't really enjoy doing that either. The other part is we talked about vitamin D and making sure your vitamin D and calcium levels are adequate. And so, as you mentioned, our stores kind of drop as we get older. And so we see that a lot in women as they get older, but we see it a lot in African Americans and darker skin patients, because as you mentioned, being out in the sunlight is so important for vitamin D. That's how we get the active form of vitamin D in our body. So if you have increased melanin in your skin, you're going to be at higher risk for having a vitamin D deficiency. And so it's not just women and men that we see as they get older. We find it sometimes in younger. I had a 40-something-year-old, early 40s yesterday lady that I checked it on, um, and hers was super low. So we find it a lot. So it, this would be something, I guess, if you know you have had multiple fractures or um, like last year, I had a little boy who was, I think, 12, 13, playing peewee football, got stepped on, and actually broke like four of his five toes. Wow. <laughs> and uh, we ended up checking his vitamin D, and it was crazy low. And so we had to send him to the endocrinologist and get checked out as to why his, uh, vitamin D was so low at such a young age. But that's something to think about. And you want to make sure that your kids, if they're not great eaters and they're not outside a lot, you probably want to have them on a multivitamin. Um, and then just all adults as we get older, too, it's probably not a bad idea to get on one of those multivitamins to help give you the calcium and the vitamin D. And since I do internal medicine as well as pediatrics for my adult patients, you know, making sure you're getting the proper osteoporosis screening. Correct. DEXA scans. DEXA scans. Yes. Yeah. So that's the bone density scan or the DEXA scan. Uh, we start that at 65 in women. Men, it's not as routine in, but you can start it at 70 to 75. It's just something to talk to your doctor about. But there are some people who are higher risk for having osteoporosis osteoporosis earlier. And so that may be something you want to talk to your doctor about. Instead of waiting to 65, we may want to screen you earlier. Oh, smoking. That's one too. I didn't bring that up. That's one that makes you hit higher risk for fractures as well and strength decreases your bone strength. Or if you had a previous fracture. Yes. Definitely, you know, people who fracture their radius, their wrist, um, their humerus, the bone in your arm, or back fractures for sure, Mm -hmm. or pelvis fractures. You're pretty much by diagnosis osteoporosis, osteoporosis and yeah. should be receiving some type of treatment. Right. Yeah. So, so most of the times we don't deal with true osteoporosis in kids, but we do find a lot of vitamin D deficiencies. Correct. So that's something to think about. If your kid is one of those that's prone and has had a couple of fractures, you may want to reach out to your doctor and get that checked. So um, one thing that you mentioned about the weights. So for people mm-hmm. who, some people will say, I don't want to lift weights because I don't want to look really muscular or I don't want to bulk up. And some people do have propensity to lift weights and get really um, bulky, but most people don't. But if you don't like weights, you can use your own body weight. Yeah. Doing planks, doing push-ups, doing sit-ups. Therabands are really good. You can get a great workout by, it's surprising what that little rubber band, how it can put stress on your body and you can really get a good workout without ever having to touch heavy weights if that's not your thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's not definitely not my thing. <laughs> and I used to go to Orange Theory, and they had the TRX machine. Yes. And that was always one of those things that, yeah. like, you don't realize just by your body weight just how much resistance yes. there is. You don't even have to pick up a dumbbell. So, no. yeah, that's such a good point. Um, with our little bit of time left, I wanted to just mention concussions yes. because we do that a lot. We see that a lot, unfortunately, too. So we actually had a kid, and it's not just sports injuries. I mean, we had Car one. Wrecks. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, we had one two days ago in clinic that was uh, car wrecks and that was coming in with uh, persistent headaches and so uh, from the concussion. So tell us a little bit about what to look for with a concussion and besides taking them out of play, is there any other special precautions they should do? Yeah, concussions can be tricky because sometimes you will not even recognize that you had an injury like or you fall down the stairs and you're worried more about the ankle sprain but forgot the fact that you bumped your head when you hit the ground. Car wrecks soccer, heading balls, Mm -hmm. basketball collisions. Uh, What we're looking at first is you go from being completely normal to having something altered. Either it can be a headache or blurred vision, 
Um, sometimes it can be that the your demeanor changes. You go from being a very mild person to being angry. Sometimes on the football field, the kid can't really express themselves, and they'll get emotional and start crying, mm-hmm. um, which is something that's completely odd. But it's not always a textbook response to say, oh, that's a concussion. So anytime I said it, it's not just the physician or the trainer who's looking out for concussions. It's the coach. It's the other players in the huddle. It's, you know, the kid that has that blank stare in their eyes and the quarterback who sit come over and say, you know, the lineman doesn't know what in the world is going on. That's a key or a sign to say, okay, let's get them out, evaluate them. And we do a quick evaluation on the sideline, but we need to see them back within days of the injury to see how they're progressing. And so we can start to challenge them with some things to get them back towards their normal activity level. But concussions, the treatment of concussions is evolving. I'm sure in the time that you practice and myself, it went from at first, if you were injured, you evaluate them. If they're better in 15 minutes, they can go back on the field. Now we say, if you have an injury, you're taken off the field to play, you're done for that day. The treatment now is getting more aggressive with our return to play and starting to introduce the athlete or the person back to some of the stimulus that might cause some of the symptoms even as we progress them back through. So Concussion management is something that's in evolution. It's something that's very serious because we're getting more and more data about the Mm post-concussion, how it affects the brain, and even leading to very serious medical conditions later on in life, even with suicide and things of that nature having association. So concussions are very important to diagnose, number one, and then make sure that we're treating them. Yeah. And, you know, repetitive, it, you yes. know, it's, it's usually not just one concussion that will do that. This is like repetitive. Correct. And that's why it's so important to be able to recognize it. Yes. Because if you like, I mean, I can remember in high school, like people, I was a cheerleader and you would see them come out on the sidelines acting goofy and then they would go right back in. Yeah. We didn't think twice about you had it. had your bell you know? rung instead of a concussion. Yeah. And I mean, they just went right back in, which yeah. is terrifying. And, you know, you think about those repetitive injuries that they have over time what's it doing and so it's so important now I feel like that we have so much more knowledge about it and we can identify it so much quicker now and even though we may be a little over aggressive with our treatment there's a reason we're doing that right. so I um, mean it's important to make sure you follow it too because we'll have a lot of athletes I've seen that have been diagnosed with a concussion and they're still having headaches and you ask them like well what what are you doing well I still look at my phone they still look at their iPad they're still watching TV they're still going to school and like even those little minor like stimuli can be overwhelming if your brain has recently been concussed. And so you have to, when the doctors tell you to rest, you've got to rest. (laughs) That first 48 hours is very important. Yes. So you really have to give that brain a rest um, so that it can hopefully heal up and heal up quicker. uh, You know, but the timeline for concussion, I feel like is so variable just because your friend healed up in 48 hours. It may be two weeks for you. Especially if you have other medical conditions, attention deficit, we know that that can make the concussion worse and, there's other medical conditions as well. Yeah, so it's just important to make sure that you're following closely with your doctor and following up with your doctor and given following the directions <laughs> and taking the rest because that's something that we don't see happen all the time. So. Thank you for continuing to support this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, then please leave a five-star review. And if you haven't done so, subscribe so you continue to get the updated episode. Until later, peace. Hey, time out with the sports doc. Never stop it. You are now tuned in. Trust you don't want to miss. This is where life, sports, and medicine.